I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today we got some questions from a viewer who is looking at moving down, but he's got some medical and mobility questions on how they're going to be able to get access to some basic stuff, nothing too crazy, here in Nicaragua, and how they look up some things about medicine and such. So we're going to be doing a uh, viewer Q&A today. We're going to get to that right after that bump. Hey guys, welcome back. We got a series of questions from Lee Kunter today, who has uh, his father is looking at moving down. We're just gonna jump right into this question. He's got a series of things. I think we're able to cover this all. So, hi Scott. First, I wanna thank you for creating these very informative videos and sharing them. I was recently laid off after 24 years. That started me thinking about retirement. My wife and I were already scheduled to be in Nicaragua in January for a cigar factory tour. Very cool. And after speaking with some friends who have already done the tour, I started to research Nicaragua and fortunately found your channel. Awesome, guys. Uh, could you please help me understand a few questions we have uh, to direct me where I might find the information on them? All right. I have this a little bit small on my screen. I'm struggling to read this. Uh, number one, how can we confirm if our current medications are available in Nicaragua? So uh, in most cases, I think that the easiest things to do with this, like one, if you're going to be visiting, like obviously you're going to have medications with you. I think for most people you want to so, so just some general stuff, right? Nicaragua has a full working economy, right? We're not, we're not in a situation where we can't get necessary things. We can't get luxury items real super easily. Like, oh, you know, there's this new microphone that came out from like a really small vendor and I would really like to get it now oh the microphone store here doesn't well first of all there's no microphone store second of all the electronic stores carry like three microphones not 300 right so that specialty item that you just want because it's like the fifth generation blah 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 that just came out last week no we don't have that you have to special order that through amazon and have it shipped in like that stuff yeah but for things you need to survive like we have everything you could want here sometimes in generics, sometimes under a different name, sometimes it's an alternative medication, uh, whatever it is, but we do have things. So the idea that you're gonna come down and like the basics of life are not gonna be here really isn't a problem. You know, some people, because they're, wow, we started off kind of shaded and now we're in some bright sun. When, uh, uh, you know, some people move down, they they have this feeling like they have to um, be worried about like basic availability. And that's just ge generally not the case. It's always the specialty items. Now, some people are diagnosed with things outside the country and they have a treatment plan that is based on medications that may not be available here. And so it can be disruptive. There can be problems and you may have a, uh, a need to stay on an existing plan. So there are situations where this is legit legitimate, just as a very basic thing, like medic medications in general are going to be available, just maybe not the exact one you're used to, but pretty often they are. Uh, if you're coming down to visit, which is always recommended, you know, obviously bring your medications with you uh, and that kind of stuff. Like you don't want to be without them. Then when you're here, if this is a, uh, an actual concern, which a lot of people have, especially those who are looking at retirement, then you're going to want to come down. And the best thing to do if it's simple stuff, just stop by a pharmacy and ask. Uh, Pharma Value is a great example. They're one of the big chains here, and they really have a broad selection. If you go into little corner places, they're going to have your aspirins and stuff, but they're not going to have a lot of that specialty medication. You need one of the bigger places. And the bigger places also have apps that you can order from online. You can look things up and so forth. So there's ways to look things up even generally from a distance, although most of those apps only work in country. They actually block you if you're outside the country. I don't know why they would do that, but they do. Um, but you can normally find out that way if you're just looking to look it up. If you really have something a little bit more uh, specialty and you really need some information on it, what you're going to want to do most likely is have a doctor's appointment while you're here. It's not a big deal. Doctors are very accessible. You can stop by, for example, if you're here in Leon, right? We're talking about people who are on vacation so or, or doing an investigation, right? You're not living here yet. You want to find out if you're viable to, of course. So, if you're here in Leon, as an example, we have a private hospital called Amoxa, uh, and they're right downtown, very accessible, super inexpensive. If you're paying for a trip down, you know, you're spending at least a few hundred dollars on the flights, spend 20 bucks at the hospital to get some questions answered. I think that would be the way to go. Personally, that's that's what I would think. Uh, so if you go to a MOXA, typically an appointment, they're not an emergency. Don't go to the ER. Just do the regular check-in at the regular. You'd say, I have some questions for a doctor. I just want to talk to someone. And it's going to be between like 10 and $15 to get in. You don't need a lot of time, right? Just have a list of medications. Say, I want to you know talk to them about these medications. And then just ask, right, are these specific things? Because they'll know if they're things they can write prescriptions for. Under normal circumstances, they can call a pharmacy and have a 
conversation. With Amoxa, in this particular example, they own a pharmacy. They could call across the street or send you across the street with information to go get prices or whatever. Now, it's a, it's a hospital pharmacy, so probably not going to be the best prices. You could probably shop around. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I thought I would be 90% cheaper than the U.S., it's only 80% cheaper. Okay, whatever. But, you know, like you could probably get the prices down if you put in some effort. But to find out if they're available, you know, basic pricing, that kind of stuff shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and if you need to do alternatives or if they don't think you're on a good plan, if they're like, what is this? No, you shouldn't be taking this. Sometimes it's just nice to get a second opinion. And while you're doing this, that might happen. Right. But I think that's a really good process to get some quick answers from someone who probably really knows. Now, that's here in Leon, where we're not a medical center, although we're getting a new hospital. We're becoming more of a medical center than we have been in the past. If you have a more acute condition or something really specialty or you come to a place like Leon. Now, of course, a lot of you won't be coming to Leon. Own, right? It's just an example. It's because where I live. But a lot of you do come to Leon because you see this show and we show a lot of Leon and you kind of want to use it as a starting point to investigate the country or you've seen something about it that really uh, tracks you. For example, our close proximity to the beach. So we totally understand why a lot of you do come to Leon who watch my show. But a lot of you will not come to Leon and it may not be on your points of interest. You may like the things about Nicaragua, but you're going to be somewhere else. Uh, it's just worth noting that the, the capital, Managua, is the medical center of the country, at least currently. But for the foreseeable future. And they have two of the top ranked uh, hospitals. For those who are coming in, if you have something that either the, the regional hospitals cannot help you with, because even that, like they're going to send you to the capital. It's a lot like being in England, right? Your, your top stuff is just going to be in London. You don't have to, you know, if you're in Birmingham, you need really, really acute care. They're probably going to send you to something in London. They're going to stabilize you and then transport you, right? It happens anywhere where you have satellite cities of a major core city. Same thing here. So our top hospitals are in the capital, Militar and Vivian Pellis. If you have um, something that other places are like, we don't think we can get this, they probably can tell you, but just in case they can't, you can go to Vivian Pellis. It's got to spend a bit more money. You're probably going to be looking closer to $100 for a consult there. But if you have something really serious, that's going to be worth it, right? Again, it's still less than your flights. This is a really important thing to get answered. So it's potentially worth it to you. I mean, obviously do your own evaluation, but very likely they're going to be able to tell you absolutely anything, right? They'll have the experts who know every medication. They're going to have access to the greatest number of medications because they, uh, my wife was just telling me that they have a pharmacy there that is, uh, has some specialty things that no one else in the country has. So they, they'll send you there for it, or they may not be aware of it. So it can be worth asking, but in most cases, unless you have something really, really specific, you probably, I think, want to ask in a lower cost location just because you're probably going to get a really quick, easy answer. But if you're in a position where they can't give you a, a good answer, Vivian Pellis may be able to help you. And that in which case, I can't imagine that spending $100 for a little bit of time with a doctor there wouldn't be an incredibly good use of your time and money. Uh, but if you're not going to be in Managua, for example, you're just coming out to Leon and you don't have some super specialty need, you just need to find things out, then probably you're going to be able to come out here, do it for cheap, do it really quick and easy. You probably probably don't need that resource, but just in case, it is there. They will also most likely be able to tell you if it's something that you could uh, access in a uh, regional hospital, right? So in some cases, for example, um, and I've never heard of anyone having to do this, can't imagine why this would come up, but we have done this for veterinary care. So it's an example of how these things can work. There are some medicines for our dogs that are not available in Nicaragua. They're not illegal or anything. It's just nobody ships them in because there isn't that much demand for them. And one of the reasons that there isn't that much demand is because they sell them right over the border in Costa Rica. And so the very few people who want that specific medication or need it for their dogs can just cross into Costa Rica. And a lot of the people who do want that are crossing into Costa Rica for other reasons anyway. And so just combine the trips. And a great example is one time we had to do this for a friend. They We were already in Costa Rica. We didn't make a trip for it. We just swung into a veterinary uh, clinic picked up the medication and drove it into Nicaragua uh, for their dog. And so that kind of stuff could happen. There are some major medical facilities in Panama, in Costa Rica, in Guatemala, in El Salvador. And there is some chance that uh, you may have something that's really specialty that they have and Nicaragua doesn't. It could happen. If Nicaragua is the right place for you to be living, it and the medication is not something you're going to die if you you know go a day without in case something were to go horribly wrong, then that may be an answer as well that, oh, you know what, this is everything in life is great because we're in Nicaragua. Getting this medication is a little bit tough, but you still don't have to go back to the United States. You may just be catching a bus over the Costa Rican border or a shuttle up to El Salvador or taking a flight somewhere. 
And I know that sounds crazy, but thinking outside the box, I know people who from the United States fly into Nicaragua to get their medications, not super rare ones, just costly ones. And it's so much cheaper. They can fly in, buy the medication and fly back and save money and get a free weekend in Nicaragua out of just lowering the cost of their medication. So little thinking outside the box, things like this in some cases could end up solving something for you that you would never have imagined you could solve in that way. That may be an answer. The second part of this question is going to follow along a lot with the first. My wife has to get an echocardiogram each year as a checkup. We would happily drive to Leon for this regardless of where we would end up moving to. How can we fight, find a great cardiologist there? So the first thing is if you are living in Leon, then probably you would do this in Leon. Like a cardiologist is very easy to find here. However, uh, and, and very importantly, we are getting in, I believe, October, a new uh, cardiac facility at the new hospital. So we may have more cardiologists with more capabilities than we have currently in the very near future out here in Leon. But for those who are not looking at a map, uh, be aware that Leon is in Nicaragua Occidental. That is where the western part of the country that kind of hangs out there into the Pacific a little bit. We're not exactly a peninsula, but we're pretty far west. So we're not the center of the country nor the center of population in any way whatsoever. And in fact, we're not even that populous as, as a region. We're okay, like we're kind of in the middle, but we're not one of the heavy population zones. In fact, the mountains are the highlands are more uh, populated than we are here. Um, we it, The city is big in Leon, but the region around it is pretty empty. It's a lot of farmland, and Chinandega to the north is even more empty. They're also in Occidental. So together, we're a relatively empty zone with one big city in the middle. So if you are looking for uh, to travel to get to a really good cardiologist, just like the last question, most of your really good cardiologists are going to be either based in or working part-time in Managua typically how it works. Once in a while, we'll find a really great person who's based here in Leon, but they'll go to Managua because that's how they get to their regional clientele. Their local ones, they do here, but to get people from all over the country so they can have a larger market, they go work out of Managua. That's very common. So chances are, if you're going to be traveling at all, you'll just want to go into Managua, both because that's where the doctors are and it's where their equipment is. If you want to get the very best, now an EKG, not generally a big deal, but the best equipment, the best facilities are going to be there. Sorry for the quick break there. I actually had an insect fly into my ear and get stuck, and I had to deal with that while doing this show. I can't believe that was actually a thing. So we were in the middle of answering about this electrocardiogram. Uh, so what I was saying is you would be, for all intents and purposes, unless you just found a doctor that you really liked in an outlying city, you're going to be traveling into Managua for that. It's just the thing that's going to make sense. So expect that that is what's going to happen. Most likely, you're going to want to use Vivian Pellis or Militar Hospitals, but there's plenty of clinics and there's per plenty of private practices. It's all about just you know, same as anywhere else, finding a cardiologist that you like. If I was doing that, if I had a heart condition, I would probably go to a Moxa here in Leon because I live here in Leon, and I would uh, have them recommend a cardiologist or ask around with people that I know. I do know people who use cardiologists here. However, in most cases, they are using someone in Managua. Managua is less than two hours away, though, for us, especially the hospitals are very easy to get to. They're on main roads, so not a big deal. That's what we would generally do is, is go in there for a lot of things just because that is where the specialties are. and It's what most people in the country do. A lot of it will just come down to where you want to live in the country, especially with like an EKG, but something that's like once a year going into Managua really isn't a big deal. And unlike, not that you can't do this in the United States, right, but it's a much more common thing here to be able to have contact with your doctor via WhatsApp or whatever. So if you have a question or a, a need for anything that doesn't require them to see you in person, it's often very easy to get a hold of them and deal with stuff. So a remote doctor that's a few hours away, because remember, nothing in Nicaragua is too far away, uh, is really generally not a big problem. All right, number three. We would like to bring my father with us and we'll pull him out of Medicaid paid nursing home. This would mean we would uh, need 24 by 7 care for him. On one of your videos, you mentioned this was doable. Absolutely, totally doable. My question is, how do you find someone or probably two people who would take turns living in a spare bedroom and providing that assistance? Okay, so there's a couple ways to approach this. One is to have full nursing staff. If you're going to do that, you're going to go through a firm that does this and that's what we did when we needed acute care here in home 24-7. That's full 24-7 monitored care. That's not where someone sleeps and is nearby. That's where someone's watching you all the time. And they're a trained medical professional who's capable of taking care of things. For that, we had nurses and a doctor that oversaw them once a day and the nurses that were there all day. And that's a much more expensive service, and but obviously you would probably go through either your doctor that you have, uh, kind of a GP, or you're going to just go to the hospital. Again, I don't tend to work with a GP, so I tend to go to a MOXA for everything and just ask them questions, and that's very easy to do. I kind of have a GP here. 
but from Amoxa. So uh, that is, um, Amoxa will operate in some ways like a full hospital. You would go there for an ER, but in other ways, think of it like an urgent care or a general clinic uh, that is private. You use it for both things, all, all three things. Uh, so that, that would be an approach. Um, if you want someone who's going to live in your house full time, um, then you're probably going to just Put in a little bit of effort while you're living here, ask around uh, and find someone or some group of people, you know, a couple, two or three people who are interested in uh, living in the house and, and doing, it's going to depend what kind of care you have, whether you're just hiring a local person who's just able to be there and help out, uh, or if you need someone with some kind of medical training or whatever. But uh, it, once you're living here, spending time here, making those connections locally and just asking around, whether you're asking your lawyer, asking friends, asking, you know, whoever, uh, asking at the hospital, they're generally able to find someone uh, pretty easily for you. Uh, number four, uh, continuation of number three above, are adult diapers available? Just real quick. Yeah, absolutely. You can buy them at the grocery store. You can buy them at the pharmacy. Like we have normal stuff here, like how it, we wouldn't function without that. Um, I ask as I have heard that tampons aren't available. This is completely incorrect. You can definitely just go down the street and buy tampons. They're available at the grocery store, right? Like it's, uh, and even with applicators, which if you're coming from Europe, um, I know that in, in many parts of the world, tampons with American style applicators are difficult to find or, or impossible to find in some extreme cases, but here even American style applicators are available. Uh, so basically everything is available here. And keep in mind, if they were for some reason not available here, someone would solve that problem really quickly, right? Because that's an easy thing to import and that would be a high demand item. So someone would definitely bring it onto the market. But if you imagine a situation where that was something you needed and no one had brought it onto the market, then the worst case scenario is like you'd have to order them from Amazon, no big deal, or you could order them from Walmart, any place like that, have it shipped to someplace like Nika Box in Miami, and you'd get it here in about two weeks, so you could brush it, but normally about two weeks for cheap items. And those things are not heavy, so they're really not expensive, and they're certainly not electronics or controlled items. So if for some reason you ever had like a really specific brand or, or type or something of anything of that sanitary kind of nature and you needed to get that here, that would be no problem should it not exist in Nicaragua, you would still be able to order it and get it in Nicaragua. So definitely not a problem, but all of those items, I can walk down the street to the supermarket and just pick up off the shelf. No problem at all. Uh, he says, I heard the tampons aren't available, but pads are. Pads are also available for sure. Uh, now, fortunately, that does impact. It doesn't um, impact. Oh, unfortunately, it does impact us, but I wonder if there are other items we won't find. There are items you won't find here, but they won't be important ones. Um, that's 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 just generally going to be the case. Uh, there will be things that are like, maybe you're not going to find them at the fruit stall in the, in the, you know, a lot of people just go to the market, like out in the street. Yeah. You're not going to find a lot of those things there, but as expats living in the country, you're going to go to grocery stores and stuff that, and shop much the way like you would in North America, kind of a halfway sort of thing. And, uh, all those items will be available in normal stores without any problem. And, and we're only talking, you know, the regular everyday grocery store here in a small, in, in an outlying city. If you were to be for some reason in Managua, and go shopping. There's lots of specialty shops that carry a lot of items that you can't get here in Leon. So if there was something, and we do have things that we want to get uh, that are not always available here. There's a, you know, certain spices or very specific cereal, right? And we may go to one of the specialty stores uh, in Managua. There are Asian markets. There are American import markets and all kinds of different things. They're, of course, they're more expensive. Uh, they don't have the big selection, but they exist. And so that those items exist out there. Now I'm very wary of things falling into my ear. Uh, that those things exist out there. Like the number of things you could get if you were willing to go shopping in Managua with a little bit of planning is almost always easy. Um, the, the, the amount of things you would be short on is so small that outside for us, right outside of really specific things like my electronics. Oh, I have very specific cameras and camera lens gear and stuff that I need. Of course, that stuff I order from the U S and some things we order from the U S to get it cheaper. Cause we just get way better pricing and we're able to do things in some Nicaraguans just don't have access to that. So they pay more to get it here. Like I had someone literally this morning trying to sell me a really specialty case, microphone converter, like a audio interface for a computer. And he's like, I just want 250 bucks for it. And I'm like, um, I can order that on Amazon right now, brand new for 129. There's no way I'm buying this from you used like, but they think it seems reasonable because in the local stores, the convenience of being able to walk in and pick it up off the shelf, they're going to charge a lot more. But you as an expat, see my video about the power of being an expat, have access to things and can easily go shopping in more broad ways. So 
really, no, there's nothing you can't get in Nicaragua. Once you combine willing to go to a supermarket, potentially willing to go shopping in Managua from time to time, and worst case scenario, just ship things in, ordering from Amazon, there's literally nothing you can't get here. It's just how much does it cost? How long do you have to wait? What is the inconvenience level? And normally those things aren't very bad either. You just have to consider them. Point number five, the point of bringing my father is so he can be with uh, the family and enjoy his remaining time. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Since he either needs a wheelchair or can use a walker for a short distance, how easy would it be to take him out? It appears it would be almost impossible due to the conditions or available space on the sidewalks and roads. I don't think this would actually be too bad. Obviously, there are going to be places where it would be problematic. Um, wheelchairs are hard because we're a colonial city. Now, keep in mind, this is super important for those who are watching this. I live in Leon. We are one of the two colonial cities. It will very quickly become apparent, if I go show you other cities, that that these are the worst places for people in wheelchairs and other uh, mobility-challenged uh, vehicles or, or devices, right? We're colonial. So all of the things you expect in a, in a more modern city or in a more modern designed village don't exist here because we're colonial and so there's we basically live in a living museum and so like a wheelchair ramp which do exist in the city but are rare uh is is something you're not likely to find because it's not required and it's not encouraged because it doesn't fit with the colonial design so people who need that are expected to be basically in other cities but if you were in managua if you were in chinandega if you were in matagalpa if you were in hinotega or esteli are they super wheelchair accessible no, not generally, not like we would say, wow, that's really accessible. No, but are they way more accessible than they are here in Leon or in Granada? Yes, they are much more accessible. So it's all about kind of finding a middle ground. So if he's going to be with you, and hopefully he's able to be, then I would say Leon and Granada probably aren't your cities. But from everything you mentioned, you're probably going to want to be closer to Managua just because there's a lot, if they have a lot of medical things that you're concerned about, that's probably where you want to be based. And Managua has a lot of beautiful stuff, right? It's a nice city, but that's not what I mean. I mean, around it within very quick reach of the city, it, it drops off into the countryside and there are cute little villages and small little nearby cities and lots of things you can do to have really nice living. So if you're like, but I want a farm or I want a small village, that's fine. You can be in the Managua zone and not in Managua proper um, and, and have just better access to a lot of those things. Be aware, like I said, there's going to be plenty of places where you're going to have problems with the wheelchair. But if you're living even here in Leon, but way better in Managua, way better in Chinadega, and you said, okay, we want to go out to dinner tonight. Well, you definitely have options. So, for example, if you were going to go out to Via Via, which we do all the time, right, you would have the option of simply, and we do this all the time, just pull up up front, park the car, not park, stop the car directly in front of Via Via, open the doors, and get everyone in. We do this because of my camera gear all the time, but you could easily do it with your father, right? Have a wheelchair, throw the wheelchair into Via Via, Use a walker just to get from the car in the front door. You're only talking about crossing the sidewalk. It's maybe two meters. So no problem at all. Maybe you could even get a wheelchair in. I just am not standing there to picture how the sidewalk looks right there. A good majority of the restaurants that we go to would either be wheelchair accessible or a walker would be able to get you in through the threshold and you can probably use a wheelchair once you're in. Even here in Leon, it would rarely be a major problem. A little bit more effort than you would find in the United States? Yes, I would say almost always certainly true. However... Unlike the United States, it is really common because of the colonial structure of Leon that you can often pull up directly in front of a business and be just a few feet away. Even if the sidewalk is just awful for navigating, it may just be for a few feet that you have to cross it, for example, because you're able to put the car directly in front of the business. So I think it may be better than it seems. But if the question was, can your father in a wheelchair make his way around the city without assistance? That would be awful. I don't think you could do that. I mean, in like a physical challenge, maybe you could pull it off, but you're talking about like, I hope I survive, wish me luck kind of challenge. Don't do that. Um, but if it's a, oh no, he's going with us to dinner and we're there to help him and we're just moving a few feet and then he's able to go around a restaurant with a wheelchair, I think you'll find that almost always it's going to be pretty decent. Um, so it, it's because he can use a walker, right? Even if it's just for a few steps, that will almost always solve the problems. So I think you'll be pretty good. And like, for example, we like to go to NL Vivero. You'll find that that is almost completely wheelchair accessible. You just have to get the wheelchair on the sidewalk, which is not high. And then the entirety of the restaurant itself is wheelchair accessible. It has ramps inside even specifically for wheelchairs. So it is completely wheelchair accessible in that major venue. I think Via Via is it's flat. So it's basically all accessible. A lot of the big places are. Um, and a lot of the beach locations will be a little bit difficult because it's beach, right? So you have a lot of sand and stuff. 
but moving around there like with a wheelchair or something should be relatively doable in many cases. So I think I think you're actually better than it seems. Definitely not perfect, um, but but not so bad. If if you find that Nicaragua doesn't end up really meeting your needs for that, um, which hopefully it does, but if it doesn't, I do know that we really noted that accessibility in Guatemala is fantastic. When we were there, we re it was something that Valentina and I made mention of to each other, just how accessible the city was in general. Um, they, it's just a thing that they uh, put a real effort into, and they don't have the colonial cities in the way that we do, so that, that tends to be um, a pretty good option for that if, if Nicaragua ends up not being what you need. But I think you'll find that it's acceptable being there are very few places that you would go out and be like oh we can't take them that would that would not be normal sure you may not choose one place or another because of that but that's about it number six my youngest daughter is in college and has a certified service dog when we we would visit would her dog be allowed in the restaurants and stores um yes so it would be extremely rare that they would not let in a service dog it's pretty rare that they don't let in random dogs um this is a dog country as much as um we have the problem with street dogs and people don't necessarily treat dogs the way that you would hope we also have this culture where dogs are allowed to go like everywhere it's a little bit surprising when you first get here that there are dogs just everywhere so when you're especially on the beach the dogs just come up to your tables and like in el vivero that i mentioned there's cats everywhere they'll pop up on your table when i go to uh desunaso the breakfast place it's like a diner a cat will come up and hang out at our table those are really normal things to have either animals that live in the restaurant animals that wander through the restaurant or animals that you bring to the restaurant totally normal service animals less normal there aren't that many people with service animals here that's definitely an exception but almost all restaurants have people bringing in just pet dogs regularly so it would be there will be places, I'm sure, that are like, you can't have a dog here, but they're going to be really exceptional. And most places, especially if it's an official service dog, I, I can't imagine that being a real problem um, pretty much anywhere. Uh, and, and most places, they'll never even question it because it's just a dog and that's what you, you do. But if she had a little bit of paperwork or is prepared to explain it in Spanish, then uh, I expect it's going to be extremely easy. It's, you'd be, you're going to be really shocked by just how many places, especially not Managua, but like here in Leon, there's just always dogs in the restaurants like that is that is absolutely normal um, now of course everyone will go up and pet the dog that's something that people are not used to not petting service dogs that's a pretty minor point overall um, but uh, yeah I think you're I think with all these things you're gonna find that most likely it's gonna be pretty good and won't be a real problem so I hope those answered those questions I did get another question while I was making this video while I was dealing with the insect in my ear and the question was about buying houses because we just had the episode where we talked about the ability or or inability depending on how you look at it to buy a house using bitcoin and other cryptocurrency here in nicaragua which is something that not very many people do anywhere but in theory you could want to do that here in nicaragua they asked what if they had a credit card and they had some specifics but i don't know that that really matters if you have a major credit card uh, mastercard or visa and you want to buy a house can you use that to buy a house so the answer again like cryptocurrency is going to be well yes if someone would accept it, you'll be able to buy it. But imagine a home seller that would take a credit card. That's an incredibly weird scenario. It could happen. You could talk someone into it, but there's a number of things that make this not make sense. One, and there's a reason, like, would you do this in the US or Canada? Nope, no one accepts that. Well, they're not going to accept it here either for exactly the same reasons. Nowhere is it illegal. It's completely legal to do so. It's just very, very strange. The reason that it's very strange is that houses are such a large purchase, and this is the same thing why you don't do this with cars, is that with really large purchases like this, the cost of the transaction to purchase with a credit card is too much. If you're buying a $100,000 house, that could be a $3,000 or greater transaction fee for using the credit card. That's a lot of money before you have any interest payments. Like that's just three. And no one's going to bear the brunt of that, right? If you're selling a house and someone says, I want to pay with a credit card, they're going to be like, okay, but you've got to pay the difference, right? No one's going to take that as a discount. And so very few people are like, ah, what's $3,000 extra? That's nothing. I'll just pay that. You might be feeling that way, but most people just aren't willing to do that. But there's much bigger problems. And that is a normal person who is selling a house is not a corporation. And it doesn't necessarily matter if you have a corporation, your house is not owned by a corporation. So you don't want a corporation that you may or may not own taking money for the house, you're going to have to have that money get to you. 
So you have to have a very specific type of corporation or relationship with one in which you're confident that the money is going to get to you. So for most people, and this is like 95 to 99% of people who are selling a house, they don't have a business that can take a credit card. So if you wanted to do this, theoretically, they would because credit cards are not available as something for normal people. You have to have not just the willingness to take a credit card, you have to have the physical ability to do so. So in order to do that, you would have to become a business because only businesses can take credit cards. So now you're going out and forming a business. That's going to take a few weeks minimum and some money, probably a few thousand dollars. And remember, all this is just for the transaction of a house. So you're talking about the cost of the house going up and up and the amount of time to buy it going up and up. People who could afford to do this are generally not willing to throw the extra time at it. Those who have the time generally don't have the money. So the combination is pretty brutal. And there's a reason why no one does it. So you wait some time to get a business open. Then after that business has been open for a little while, it can open a bank account. Once it has established its bank account, we're getting into months here. Now you're able to, in theory, request a credit card machine. Now you're only able to get a credit card machine under certain conditions. I think if you admitted you were going to sell a house and that was the only thing you were going to do, they wouldn't give you a credit card machine. They would not consider it. They'd say you don't have a viable place of business. You're not taking any kind of transactions that we can see. Therefore, you don't qualify for a credit card. So I don't think it's even going to be allowed by the credit card processors and banks, but let's imagine that it was, it does take a bit of time and you'll eventually get your credit card machine. Once you've done all those things, figured out how to use it, gotten it working and all that, then you can accept the credit card transaction from the person who's going to buy the house, pay the 3% fee on top, and in theory, buy the house. As you can see, that's a lot of money and a lot of time, like a lot. You could be talking in for a $100,000 house, you could be talking in excess of, say, $10,000 in order to make that transaction and possibly waiting as much as six months to be able to do that transaction, even if everything went pretty smoothly. That's a lot. Anyone who is able to make that payment on a credit card probably would just find a better way around it. It's so easy to buy a house if you have the financial resources to, to do so. It's so easy to find another way to do it. And if you don't have the financial resources to do that, then the incredible cost of getting the, the credit card able to be used, along with the insane level of interest, the payments that would be on it, would be crippling and you would not be able to do it. So it's the kind of thing where anyone who would actually be able to do it would not be willing to do it kind of thing. It's just it falls into a, a, a never comes up in reality kind of thing once people figure out what it would actually take to do it. There's a reason why there's so many existing mechanisms for this that work so well, mortgages and personal loans and so forth. You can just go to a bank and work this out and do a one-time transaction that costs a fraction as much, is happens much faster and is much safer. And of course, if you're the seller of a house, you have to look at it from the, their perspective as well. Not only are you doing all these wild and expensive and time-consuming things for someone who's buying the house, you don't have confidence that they're going to buy the house in the meantime. Because of course, the thing that normally gives you confidence is either that they put their money in an escrow and they have some guarantee or they've paid you and you have that guarantee. Doing this potentially thousands and thousands of dollars and months of delay, all costing you money. Because remember, you can't sell your house during this time, presumably, all this stuff is tying you up and putting you at risk and spending your money if you even have the money to spend. And not everyone has the legal right to open a business. There's complications behind that. Most people do, but not all for sure. And uh, many don't qualify for the bank accounts, even if they do have a business. Like there's just a lot of people can't do it no matter what they want to do. Um, but no one would want to do it because they would have to take on so much risk. And it's guaranteed that the person who's buying it doesn't have enough money to buy the house. That's why they would use a credit card in the first place. And so it means that they're putting up a lot of risk on their end for someone who's already a risky buyer, that they're not going to have confidence in them until they've completed the transaction. And so while they may be perfectly happy to sell you a house, they need to see the money and the credit card process won't show them the money for a really long time. They would be smart to walk away. So I don't think you're ever going to find anyone ever who's willing to discuss the possibility of taking a credit card on a house, even though as, as a theoretical experience, Experiment, absolutely legal, but as a practical one, absolutely never going to happen. And then the question was asked, well, what about their broker? Their broker could take the credit card. Well, to some degree, the broker has the same problems, but you have the problem, and we've seen brokers do this, that they will just steal the house. You don't have any confidence that the money going to the broker will make it to the seller, in which case you could be left having made a giant uh, payment and not having a house to show for it at the end. And of course, the seller then is in a position where they didn't get paid and, and they're angry. It's just, it's super risky. Because imagine this broker, right? 
who already doesn't have a good reputation, as they generally don't here uh, or anywhere, right? In the U.S., the, 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 the reputations are absolutely terrible. The places that people often consider the best ones are the ones that lost the lawsuits recently. So the idea that there's integrity in the system obviously doesn't exist. That's a farce. Uh, so there's no rational person who would ever trust someone in that role to hold the money ever, right? Like that is, that's not their job. That is not, there's nothing that makes that make sense. So paying a broker who works against at least one of you a ton of money enough to retire on in most cases uh, in cash and just hoping that they complete the transaction for you when they have all this money in their hands and what are you going to do about it if they take off with it? It's. I'm not saying that the average broker is going to going to take off with your money. I'm saying if one in ten was willing to do that, you would never take that kind of risk with that kind of money. A hundred thousand dollars, maybe, and you just gave it to a random stranger, a stranger who's already not acting in your interest, who's already making your life rough in buying a house. No, there are absolutely so many red flags in that. Like this is financial ruin, uh, basically guaranteed if that's a path you're going down. So none of those things should occur. So yes. Yes, you're legally allowed to do just about anything you want. And just like with cryptocurrency using credit cards for buying a house, there's a reason why people don't do it. It just fundamentally doesn't make sense. Credit cards can't be accepted in that way. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee with a credit card at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And uh, that comes directly to me. It's like Patreon and helps make everything we do possible, cameras, microphones, and all the different things. Uh, I will not be buying that $250 audio converter that I have no need for, but it's nice to know that people are offering it to me. I'll see you all tomorrow.